I'm turning the recording on. Check my chat one last time. And now we will officially begin. Okay, multitasking. Excellent multitasking. Right, so welcome again to Odd Sex 32 and to Sydney. Uh, sorry, cannot read and admit at the same time. And welcome to Cindy Ermis, who will be talking to us about crisis and contagion, researching disease and disaster in the 18th century Atlantic world. It is an absolute pleasure to introduce Cindy today, and I'm really honored that she is joining us today to share her research. Cindy Ermes is a Director of Medical Humanities and the Assistant Professor of History at the University of Texas at San Antonio. She specializes in the history of medicine and environment. stupid boxes, uh, medicine and environment, especially disease epidemics and disasters in 18th century France and the Atlantic world. Uh, she has also published on digital history and the historical profession. She is the author of The Great Plague Scare of 1720, Disaster and Diplomacy in the 18th Century Atlantic World, which came out with Cambridge University Press this year, and Urban Disasters, another Cambridge University Press book. Her next book, co-authored with Claire Ed Ed Eddington, sorry, with Claire Eddington of uh, UCSD, is a global history of epidemics. Beyond her research and teaching, she is co-founder and executive editor for the open access peer-reviewed publication, Age of Revolutions. And given Odd Sex's uh, kind of open access, uh, kind of public facing digital format, and our own history relationship with epidemics and the COVID inquiry, I think it's you know, absolutely fitting and wonderful that we end uh, 2023 with uh, Cindy's talk today. So without further ado, I'm going to have one less strand to my multitasking and pass over the talking to Cindy. Thank you so much, Elaine. It is really, truly a pleasure to be here. If I may, I'm going to share my screen. Give me a moment to get this going. Voila. Okay. So, yes, thank you, uh, everybody, for, for being here uh, on this Tuesday, or this autumnal Tuesday here in San Antonio, at least rather mild. Um, thank you, uh, Elaine. I'd like to also thank Dr. Uh, uh, Carrie Sinanen for the invitation in the first place, and of course to Odd Sex for uh, organizing. And, and, and just, uh, like, as I said, it's a real honor. So today I'm going to speak a little bit about my my experience or my journey, if you will, um, uh, coming to the work that I do in disasters uh, and disease. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, as I said, how I got to this point, and and then I'll talk about my recent publications, which Elaine just uh, mentioned. And so the first thing I'll say is, you know, one of the questions I've gotten the most. Uh, over the years is how I came to work on crisis and catastrophe. As we were saying just before we got started here in our chat, uh, it's not the cheeriest of topics <laughs> to uh, to work on. Certainly during the pandemic, it was uh, interesting. Let's leave it at that. And so kind of interesting perspectives. And so really it goes back to graduate school, right? My um, my thesis, really, uh, my master's thesis in particular is where I start really working on this. I was living in Tallahassee. I got my, I earned my PhD uh, over in uh, Florida State University. And so I was working down the road from New Orleans. And my first research trip to work in an archive uh, before, uh, so I ended up earning, let's see, I defended my master's thesis in 2010. So this would have been like 2008. I went over to uh, to Seville in Spain to work in the uh, colonial archives out there. And I, you know, kind of started strategically somewhat thinking, you know, I'm going to you know, just kind of look for something to just pop out of the archives kind of thing, you know, just pre-masters me. And so sure enough, that actually it worked out because that's what happened. I started seeing a lot of mention in some of these doc, uh, collections that I was looking at of a fire that took place. I was looking at colonial archives after all, and I was focusing in 
the region where I was living at the time because I figured, well, you know, if anything, I can continue my research back home. That was the idea. And sure enough, I kept coming across mention of this fire, this fire in, in colonial New Orleans when New Orleans was Spanish. And I guess, long story short, I ended up, uh, that was the topic of my master's thesis. And I came back home to the States and continued my research in the city of New Orleans itself over several trips and weeks here and there. And it was on the fire that took place in 1788 in New Orleans, as I said, when it was a Spanish colony. And it ended up being my first ever journal publication and uh, also the chapter in an edited volume that is coming out. In fact, soon I was able, I, I really through the years wanted to revisit this article and I finally got the opportunity to revisit it and make it much better and update it and everything else. So that's going to be in an edited volume uh, uh, coming out this year. And so, um, right. And so that was the beginning of my work with disasters, really. It's thinking about how disasters have been managed in the past, how we have understood them, how they influence the way we perceive them or manage them today, these kinds of questions that I continue to tackle in, you know, in my work in different contexts. And when it was time to start thinking about my uh, dissertation, I, I basically thought that I was going to do a case studies, uh, a case study look at a series of case studies. Each chapter was going to be a different 18th century disaster because I am a historian of the 18th century, primarily uh, of France and the Atlantic world. And so I thought, well, you know, I already know one chapter will probably be um, the Lisbon earthquake. Another chapter will be the 1720 uh, plague uh, that unfolded in Provence that I'm going to speak about here in a moment. And, uh, and, the other ones I figured, you know, I had a list of disasters and I figured we'll see what the archives have to say. So I began my research in Paris. And when I get to Paris, I start with this big collection I'd been looking forward to consulting on the consular papers of the French consul in the port city of Cadiz in Spain. So already it was transnational to begin with just because of this first collection that I that I tackled. And everything, so it was just incredible to me how the topic of conversation among everybody for the years that I was looking at here, uh, 1720s, was about this plague outbreak. I mean, if I had just, I could have written a book with just that collection. And so I was like, I have to follow where this goes. I have to see where this goes. Again, long story short, I ended up realizing I have to write the whole book on the plague in Provence, 1720, because there is just too much here. And one chapter is simply not going to do it justice. And I'm just going to be trying to do too much otherwise. I ended up doing too much in any case, but at least it was looking at this one topic. Because what I did is I began my research in Paris and I followed the uh, the the voices basically across uh, archives uh, in Western Europe and some in the United States. I ended up conducting research for this project in 20 different archives and libraries uh, in Europe. Uh, as I said, a few here in the United States, uh, New Orleans, for example, Washington, DC. I looked at uh, consular papers, uh, correspondence, of course, public health officials, heads of state, uh, representatives and diplomats, uh, ecclesiastical authorities. So I looked at all of those kinds of papers, family papers for that matter. I looked at newspaper collections, sermons, uh, contemporary images, uh, of course. And so taking this all together after many different trips uh, and many different visits uh, to archives uh, in the UK, in Italy, in Portugal, in Spain, in France. Uh, and I said, so, uh, as I said, some here, uh, I was able to piece together the story uh, to the extent that I did. And that brings me to my first book. So I'll switch slides here. The uh, Great Plague, uh, the Great Plague Scare, excuse me, of 1720, Disaster and Diplomacy in the 18th Century Atlantic World. So this book uh, is on one of the last major epidemics of plague in Western Europe, the 1720 plague of Provence, uh, more typically known as the plague of Marseille, the great plague of Marseille, if you've heard of it. So a little bit on what happened. As the story goes, uh, the plague arrived in the port of Marseille in May of 1720 on a ship called the Grand Saint Antoine. 
um, it had spent a year in the Levant uh, gathering goods for a major trade fair that took place annually in the south of France, the Foie de Beaucaire. On its journey, it experienced several deaths. Okay, there were deaths, some, not all, but some with the marks of contagion, which is to say the enlarged lymph nodes at the neck or underarms or the groin, for example, um, and uh, very quick death. And so when it arrived in the port of uh, uh, one of the ports in, in Italy, in Livorno, it was supposed to be inspected by the local doctor. Rumor had it that the doctor never went on board and just gave the ship the pass to keep going, despite the deaths on board by that point. This was right before it went headed back to Marche, um, saying that it was just a contagious fever, that it wasn't anything like, you know, like plague. And so it was given the okay to keep going and it arrives in Marche. And because part of the cargo was owned by one of the higher ups in the local government, one of the city's uh, leading echevons, a man named Jean-Baptiste Estelle, uh, the ship was even there, given kind of sped through the, the quarantine instead of stopping at its usual uh, farther away island uh, of Pomeg. It was sped through an island called Jar. And so the plague arrives in Marseille how long it lasted, uh, about from 1720 to 1722, it lasted two years. And so the tricentennial really just ended. Um, and it arrived, put up this little map here, uh, through, as I said, the port of Marseille and it spread from there throughout the region of Provence. It ended up taking, uh, this is a rough estimate, of course, um, as many as uh, 126,000 lives in the, French region of Provence primarily, but also the the edges of the uh, of the region. So, for example, Languedoc, uh, Le Comte, the Dauphiné, which is modern day Rhône Alps. For reference, uh, uh, as I said, about one hundred twenty six thousand lives in this area. Uh, the population of Provence at this time was again roughly six hundred thousand. So that's a very sizable chunk of the population. In fact, by some accounts. Uh, at its height in 1720, the plague may have taken as many as a thousand people per day in the port city of Marseille alone. So this is an extremely virulent public health uh, disaster, really. Um, and nevertheless, it was successfully contained to this region, although it did get out of Marseille quite a ways. Um, it was successfully contained within southeastern France. Uh, as a result, in part, of measures put in place on the ground, not only in France, but across Europe. Um, and so this is why I refer to this as the plague of Provence, really, um, and not just the plague of Marseille, because I didn't want to erase the experience of those tens of thousands of people who suffered from this crisis outside of the city of Marseille. And so it spreads from there, as I said, um, and part of the reason, of course, part of the reason is because in times of disease, those who are able to flee, they flee and they take their flea ridden cargo with them, for example. Right. But um, it also spread because of a campaign of misinformation. And this will ring familiar to us uh, to this day, of course, that unfolded really from the earliest days from uh, uh, of the plague uh, back in May of 1720, that whole summer, really. Um, until basically August when it was kind of undeniable by that point that, you know, it's plague that is reigning in Marseille and you can't really deny it at the point uh, beyond that. But local uh, authorities, including public health officials initially, so not just, you know, city officials, uh, denied that it was plague. They even paid some doctors to come in from Montpellier um, and uh, these doctors actually had been sent from Paris, from the region in Paris, ordered to go into Marseille and investigate, but then they were paid to say that it was not plague, but uh, again, just, you know, a fever. Um, and so that didn't help things and that helped that, you know, the fact that there was this campaign of denial that lasted weeks and weeks made it to where the plague was able to spread as far as it did. 
but eventually the truth is uh, undeniable and the shutdowns and the local measures begin. And so, and I should mention very quickly in case um, any of you are, are not familiar with the disease, uh, hopefully none of you are personally familiar, but in case none of you, some of you haven't um, looked into what the disease of plague itself is, we hear that word all the time, it's used to refer to everything from COVID, it was used for AIDS and, and so on. But plague, the disease is caused by a bacteria, not a virus, called uh, Yersinia pestis. The actual pathogen was discovered in the late 19th century during what we call the third plague pandemic that unfolded mostly in Asia, in, uh, in China, for example. And um, this is, uh, as I said, a bacterial infection that comes in different forms. And it comes in the bubonic form, which, as I mentioned, involves these enlarged lymph nodes, among other uh, symptoms like fever and general malaise and uh, acral necrosis, which is where your extremities can can decay basically, and that is the symptom that gives uh, that inspired the name Black Death, right? And so we start to see this disease uh, in Western Europe by the late 14th century, and that really marks uh, the beginning of what we call the Second Plague Pandemic, because with the Black Death begins an era that lasted hundreds of years in Western Europe through the 18th century. Um, of disease outbreaks, very regular plague outbreaks, uh, generational in some cases, sometimes even more frequently. And some of them, including this one, could be extremely virulent, extremely just, just really destructive uh, on many levels. Um, and then it starts to, the that plague outbreaks start to die off by the 18th century. By the time you get to this point, there was a 1720 outbreak in Marseille, and then there was one more uh, large outbreak in Messina in Sicily in the 1740s. It wasn't as uh, as large uh, or as, uh, you know, it didn't take as many lives as the one in Marseille, but it was nevertheless a, a big concern in Europe at the time uh, in the 1740s. And there's a lot of, we don't really understand why disease the disease disappeared from Western Europe. Um, there's debate about why there's different you know, uh, arguments. In the, probably it's a, a combination of all of these. Was it generational immunity? Was it the effectiveness of the public health apparatus that had emerged in Europe by this point? Was there a biological explanation like the disappearance of the plague to more remote rodent populations. We don't entirely know. Um, but in any case, plague did continue to, uh, there were plague outbreaks in uh, in Russia, for example, in the Ottoman Empire, uh, in Eastern Europe, they did continue. And so individuals responded to this uh, disease much as they had really since the Black Death. It was based on miasmatic understandings of disease, which is to say that disease is caused by uh, miasmas, you know, bad vapors in the air that would throw off the humors, the four humors that were believed to uh, to exist in the human body. Um, and miasmas could come from a series of sources like stagnant water, anything that smelled bad, um, and a number of examples. And so people responded with prayer. They responded, you know, and, you know, with religious uh uh, rituals and things. They responded also with superstition, you know, the stones and tallymen and relics and prayer and hanging garlic around their necks, you know, you'd think the same as, you know, with vampires, I guess. But um, it was secular responses, though, really at this time that were notably different in a number of ways. And so coming to this topic as a historian of disasters, um, I was interested not only on the impact of historical disasters in their own time and place, right? In this case, France, but how they have informed how we both understand and manage them today. This therefore shaped the research questions that inspired me to write the book, which I alluded to in the beginning of the talk here. You know, how have we managed disasters in the past? Um, how has this informed anything about how we manage them today? How have we understood them? Um, and so really I approached the 1720 plague of Provence through the lens of disaster studies in this book. And so rather than look at only what transpired in France, I look at uh, the ramifications of this public health disaster uh, in surrounding regions and across oceans, really, in the uh, mostly the Atlantic colonies 
um, with a focus on the French and Spanish colonies in particular. Excuse me. So it's very much a transnational study. I, uh, I followed the ramifications uh, in neighboring regions to unravel how authorities in port cities of, uh, as I said, France, the Italian city-states, Great Britain, Spain, uh, and the French and Spanish colonies managed the crisis. So what I did is I thought it'd be kind of cool to set up the chapters geographically in order of distance from the seat of infection, from, you know, from Provence, um, as, uh, you know, the chapters basically trace the outbreaks ramifications outward from, from France to so some of the most active port cities really of the 18th century Atlantic world. In fact, each port discussed in my manuscript was a significant trading hub. They were connected by their close commercial ties to one another, diplomatic ties. They all responded to the plague of Provence in unique ways uh, or for unique motives in many cases. And so fundamentally the book explores a, a moment in history, right? This these years of the plague and a little and beyond that. Um, and the plague of Provence is really representative uh, of important shifts that were taking place by this time, by the early 18th century, both in approaches to handling uh, disease and disasters and in the ways in which these were understood. And so in tracing the ramifications uh, as I said, outward from France, a number of important considerations and developments rose to the surface. Uh, and these form the main objectives of my book. So very briefly, what are those, uh, or some of these at least uh, considerations or, or developments? Most fundamentally, I would say, is the importance of this transnational approach of, in, in this case, decentering the disaster so to speak, right? And following the sources to see how far the ramifications went, or at least beginning to understand how far the ramifications went, because I could have kept writing more chapters on other parts of the world. Um, but as you know, any of you who've written a book know, at some point you have to just decide where you're going to stop researching and get the, the book done, right? And what emerges from this approach was really a vast network uh, as I discuss in the book uh, of cum uh, of communication, excuse me, regarding the plague of Provence that really stretched across the globe. This is what I call in the book uh, an invisible commonwealth that in many ways functioned like a separate autonomous community or a detached state, as I called it, where consuls, ambassadors, public health officers, uh, and others exchanged and spread information uh, working to shape the responses to the crisis in their own, excuse me, respective regions. So they discussed a number of things, for example, precautions and measures that were being taken uh, against the plague and not only in France, but throughout Europe, for example. Uh, others debated the effectiveness of quarantine in preventing the spread of plague. Um, they exchanged stories, their own or those of others, about arrests about shootings, you know, uh, forced searches of vessels and homes uh, and people, of course, for that matter. They told stories about ship burnings, um, quarantines and so on, almost always in port cities as people attempted to travel or conduct business while the plague rage, uh, raged in southern France. And so really what emerges, as I said, um, from archival documents at this time is this network, right? Uh, of interconnected port cities that increasing rep uh, increasingly represented a, a global community of sorts, a series of settlements that, um, while geographically distant, function together in many ways, right, if that makes sense. There were also, of course, intellectual shifts tied because of these communications, because of this network of communication. There were intellectual shifts in understandings about disease and contagion um, as well, right, that were driven by the fear of or an interest in the plague in Provence, France. And so already based on what I've said alone, the 1720 plague of Provence is already a monumental event in many ways, right, because it influenced um, not only how we view infection at the time and the influence uh, or usefulness, excuse me, of quarantine, but also how we managed these crises. And this forms 
the most central argument in my book, okay? And that is that the Provencal plague marked uh, a major shift in Europe from more local or uh, municipal level disaster management toward more centralized uh, methods for handling crises. So it was a formative moment, I argue, in, in other words, of what I call disaster centralism. Disaster centralism is the phrase that I use simply to refer to this uh, centralization of disaster management that was different. Okay. Um, and so what we find really, and, and you know, and in some ways this, this, it doesn't go without saying, but it kind of goes without saying, <laughs> public health and disaster management. I say it goes without saying today because I feel like we have so much experience with disaster now in this new era of disaster driven in large part by uh, climate change and globalization and the interconnectedness of the globe to say nothing of the transmission of news when in a split second, right? Because of TV and the internet and everything else. But public health and disaster management were essential to the centralizing state of the 18th century. Throughout the plague of Provence, monarchs across Europe employed plague time measures to achieve a number of political and commercial objectives um, using the fear of plague as the motive or as the uh, as the pretext, which is a word that came up in a number of languages across archival collections in Europe. Among these uh, objectives, the threat of plague served as, a, as I said, as a pretext to clamp down on smuggling, to deliberately consolidate monarchical power, uh, and rein in defiant portions of the population. We see this in Spain. Uh, to outmaneuver or improve one's place among uh, commercial competitors. Or merely in retaliation for perceived uh, transgressions, like the imposition of quarantines, embargoes, or vessel searches. So there was a sort of tit-for-tat kind of thing going on where when uh, Spain imposed, for example, quarantines against the UK, against Great Britain, Great Britain responded with quarantines against Spain, even though plague was not present in either. <laughs> so commercial interests really we find uh, and these diplomatic relationships drove responses to the plague no less than did concerns over uh, public health. And so what we see uh, at this time is that responses to the threat of infection came not just from France, but from all over Europe and therefore its colonies um, and primarily uh, from the uh, capitals of these emerging nation states. In France, for example, uh, at this time, we see that responses um, consisted of a myriad of some of them tried and true and some more uh, uh, the revolutionary really in, in, the, in the sense that they were coming from Paris where the regent lived at the time rather than from local or municipal authorities, many of which had been in fact dispersed by plague itself. Many died and many fled. Um, the, uh, this was the case, the government of Aix-en-Provence, uh, the capital of Provence at the time. Um, and still the, uh, the, you know, the governing council literally was dispersed. There was nobody left to <laughs> to run it. And so Paris steps in and decides, you know, they're going to, to run the show and be kept abreast of everything going on down south. So they deployed military commanders, just to give you some examples, uh, placing agents on the ground, uh, bestowing them with unlimited authority to help manage the crisis. Uh, they therefore, of course, increased communication between the capital and heads uh, of the provinces. They intensified surveillance and pro police presence in infected areas, uh, which also allowed for, as I said, the clamping down of smuggling. They issued uh, quarantines with directions for carrying them out in all infected towns, prohibiting the movement in and out of Provence. Uh, all of this was enforced with a massive military cordon, a sanitary cordon, uh, the, these guarded lines, literally these soldiers, you know, uh, armed to the teeth and ordered to shoot anybody who tried to cross, to leave, uh, or, you know, to leave the region. And in fact, an interesting point here, for any of you who have been to, uh, to Provence, if you've seen remnants of the plague wall, La Mue de la Peste, it's, uh, this is some of the spots where these soldiers 
were uh, initially standing, right, told to uh, not allow anybody out of the province. Uh, officials from Paris also saw to it that food was distributed, that merchandise and other properties suspected of infection were burned. Streets and homes underwent ritual disinfections. Um, probably most notably, they also created new health bureaus um, in Provence and also a centralized council of health uh, in Paris itself. In fact, the plague of Provence saw some of the earliest appearances of these centralized, and that's the key phrase there, the key word, uh, boroughs of health like this one. And so we see essentially that crisis management is now founded on this increased dialogue between the capital uh, of Paris and local Provençal officials, and their efforts were deemed a success for decades thereafter. Um, now, to be clear, some of these methods like health certificates, as I said, they weren't new, but they'd never been directed by a centralized government before. And this didn't just happen in France. Even though that's where the plague was, it would follow that, well, that's where all of these really harsh measures uh, were put in place. But really, uh, as I've already hinted, this also measures just like this were also put in Spain uh, and in Britain and in Italy to protect from the infection, you know, to, to keep the infection from entering their own realms, their own regions. Um, and then, of course, there was the extension of these measures in the colonies, um, which was kind of its its own thing, because in the colonies, um, they weren't as uh, well enforced for a number of reasons. And in some cases where they were well enforced, there were issues that arose from that, which we could talk about. But and so, um, and so, right, we see the creation, as I said, of health bureaus, uh, centralized health bureaus in Spain as well. The uh, Ministerio de Sanidad, today's Ministerio de Sanidad, the Ministry of Health, if you trace all of the iterations of the Ministry of Health in Spain back to the 18th century, it begins in 1720 with the creation of the Junta Suprema de Sanidad that was created in response to the plague in Provence at this time. Um, and so, and then again, the, the, the idea there was to increase communication between the capital and the regions and the provinces uh, to be kept up to date in all things having to do with public health uh, in, back, back home in the capital. Excuse me. And so reactions to the plague in France, they can't be looked at in isolation. Officials from across Europe looked to other states as they contemplated how to handle the threat of plague in France. And this, this ended up having a lot of uh, influencing in, in large part how one place responded over another. And so the plague of Provence remains really one of the most commemorated disasters in history, in France, at least. The epidemic has been memorialized through the construction of churches, um, the designation of street names that remain to this day, artworks of various mediums, painting statues, stained glass windows, uh, monuments, plays, poems, sermons. And as I said, after it happened, for many, many decades thereafter, into the early 20th century, really, it was deemed a huge success. So whenever future at the time, you know, outbreaks of like yellow fever, for example, in the 18th and 19th century um, took place in Europe, some of the contemporary writings were saying, well, let, what did they, let's look at what they did back in 1720, because it obviously worked and let's do it again, right? So, so there's a lot of, not just uh, the influence of the plague didn't just kind of cross uh, geographic boundaries, but temporal boundaries as well. And so that is my um, first book really in a nutshell, switch slides here. While this book was in production, and I was already thinking of disasters, uh, obviously, for years at this point, while the book was in production, this first book was in production, I started to uh, to write my contribution to the Cambridge Elements in Global Urban History series uh, titled Urban Disasters. In this book, I go back to looking at disasters more broadly. Um, in a nutshell, it looks at disasters uh, at case studies from the 18th century, my home century, so to speak, uh, through today. Uh, it begins with an introduction that looks at central concepts in the study of disasters. Uh, and then um, the first uh, section or chapter, I guess, um, looks at earthquakes and tsunamis 
including the Lisbon earthquake of 1755, the Haiti earthquake, for example, um, in 2010. Uh, the next chapter looks at wind and water. So there I look at the 1931 China floods, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. Uh, Urban Inferno is the next chapter where I look at the, the, the 1788 fire in New Orleans as well as the Chicago fire. Uh, and then I look at the chapter on pestilence uh, in which I look at, of course, the 1720 plague and also cholera and COVID-19 to bring it to the present. And then I conclude the, the, the book or the element as they call it with a look at climate change today, uh, a look at coastal cities, the vulnerability of coastal cities, the future of urban disasters and questions like that. And so in this book, really, I emphasize the idea of which I'm a proponent um, that there's no such thing as a natural disaster, all right? Nor are disasters sudden occurrences. Uh, instead, we really need to understand them as these long, drawn-out events that have a history and a future. And so the term natural disaster, which I only use one time in this book to say that this is the only time I'm going to use it, and here's why, um, it denotes an act of God, right? Uh, an adverse event that occurs through natural processes um, or divine processes, uh, if you look at really act of God, right? Look at it as an act of God. Um, so it denotes, uh, as I said, you know, these uh, extreme events that are beyond human influence or beyond human control. And this is at best problematic. So the label of natural disaster removes too often deliberately responsibility from human actors uh, and their decisions in creating a disaster when in fact the human element is central, if to varying degrees, in creating disasters, right? So consider, for example, and this is an example I use in the element, um, consider a hurricane. The characteristics that define a hurricane, so a rotating storm with strong winds uh, and rain, of course, low pressure center, et cetera, are not in themselves synonymous with a disaster. Right. A hurricane is a hurricane. While at sea, in other words, a hurricane is little more than a big storm. As uh, anthropologist at UF, retired now, I believe, Anthony Oliver Smith has, uh, has, uh, has uh, written. The disaster itself then results when this large rotating system approaches a, co uh, 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 approaches a coastline that was made vulnerable by factors, by a number, any of a number of factors for that matter. For example, coastline development, um, large coastal populations, inadequate flood and or wind infrastructure, lack of storm barriers, natural or otherwise, um, construction in low lying areas and, and, and so on, I could go on. So put another way, although a hurricane itself is not a uh, human made, although I should, these storms are becoming stronger and more frequent as a result of anthropogenic climate change. So even then the argument could be made, but um, but in any case, it's for the sake of argument, hurricane is not itself human made. Its development into a disaster will result not merely from its movement inland, but largely from human decisions made on the ground for decades or even centuries before its arrival. And so these are the kind of questions that I tackle in this uh, element. Why do disasters happen? What is the relationship between cities and disaster? Uh, how have cities responded in times of crisis, of course, and what kind of practices, infrastructures, or institutions have urban areas introduced to prevent them from, to prevent disaster from happening, and, and so on and so forth. But given the topic uh, of really a, of all my research, but certainly the topic of this element, I try to end it on a more hopeful, positive note, on a cheerier note. And so I'd like to conclude here today with a short excerpt. The excerpt is, is the last paragraph of the book. Uh, if I may, this is a, again quoting. Growing up in the 1980s and 90s, I recall constantly hearing about a different environmental crisis, uh, different from crisis, uh, excuse me, climate change, which is what I had just been writing about before this paragraph. Uh, and that is the depletion of the ozone layer, all right, which we are all familiar with. Uh, the discovery in the 1980s that the protective layer of gas that absorbs harmful 
ultraviolet radiation from the sun was due to disappear in the following decades. Uh, it caused worldwide alarm and led to the adoption in 1987 of the Montreal Protocol uh, on substances that deplete the ozone layer. And international, this was an international uh, environmental agreement that regulated, I'm quoting here, the production and consumption of nearly 100 man-made chemicals referred to as ozone-depleting substances, ODS, uh, and it was adopted on the 15th of September, 1987. The protocol is to date the only UN treaty ever that has been ratified in every country on earth. Ending that quote. Today, as the ozone layer slowly recovers, the landmark agreement serves as a model example of what the world can achieve when it comes together under a common cause. From where we stand, the road to combating climate change seems long and the challenges daunting. But collective action has worked before, and it may well work again. In fact, it must. It may be our only hope. Thank you. I was so entranced by that, I couldn't find my little clap function. Uh, join me in uh, thanking uh, Cindy for that wonderful chat uh, and, and putting together lots of lots of thoughts then and now and all together. Um, give people a few moments to put together their thoughts and questions. And while I'm doing that, can I ask Cindy, I, I read somewhere on the internet, so it must be true, that we've solved acid rain. Is that that like the ozone layer, that acid rain, that thing that was a big problem in the 80s, that somehow right, that right. actually we, we have banded together as you know a community of humans and um, that's no longer a, a pressing environmental crisis, not because there are bigger crises that have overshadowed it, but because actually acid rain doesn't happen anymore. Um, I actually have come across it as well, but I got to confess, I haven't looked into it. So I don't know if it's true. And if anybody does no, please, by all means, chime in. Don't disabuse me. I, I need some help. It's my, <laughs> I like thinking about that. We made something. I really or... hope so. I really hope that that is true because there's more room for hope there than isn't there. Uh, if you have a question, uh, you can raise your hand or you can ping something into the chat. So Kathleen Gomez has asked um, if your book addresses the Pashtigo fire. It does. I mention it um, pretty briefly in that chapter, in the section, I should say, on, on the Chicago fire um, and how much more destructive over geographic space the Pashtigo fire was, but we never even hear about it. In fact, I'm glad to see you even mentioning it. People don't often uh, know it. They know about the Chicago fire that overshadowed it because it took place in, an, in a city, basically. Um, and it was destructive of, you know, urban, uh, the urban environment. But this but, is the, uh, the yeah, Pashtigo. Pashtigo. Say again, sir? Oh, Pashtigo, is that? That was saying Pashtigo. Sorry. Sorry, that was yeah. my fault. That's no, 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 not at all. I've referred to it that way before. Yeah, I, it's my yeah. uh, my uh, Miami accent or my Cuban accent coming out. <laughs> bueno, it's Pashtigo, mija. Pashtigo. Si mismo, si mismo. Thank you. Uh, Bethany, I, I see you have a hand up. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, um, that was really great. Thank you, Cindy, so much. Uh, Thank you. So it sounds sort of like the Elements book is the book you thought you were going to write when you started out to write your first book. And I'd love for you to talk more about um, <clears throat> how you organize all the archive research that you do over such a long period of time um, or right. don't organize it and then find it later and then go, oh, shit, I found that thing that I had before. Weird. Um, and sort of just how that influences where your work is. Thank you. That's such an important question because, my gosh, I think we all have experience with this and, and have struggled with it. Um, this was my this is my once dissertation, right? So this is going back to the 2010s when I began really working about it, thinking about the plague in, in 2010, in fact, 
as I moved toward uh, research and then eventually everything else. I defended in 2014 for reference. And so um, I was very much just kind of figuring out, uh, figuring it out as I went along. And because I was so deep into it, by the time I started learning about new kind of research management programs and software and things like that, I never went back to restructure everything and incorporate it into those into that kind of software, you know, not even Zotero, if you can imagine how chaotic it must have been. Um, and so really, I kept with what I started with, which is to say, when I'm in the research, excuse me, when I'm in the archive, as I go through documents, um, I very quickly kind of scan through for key phrases, right? Because you're only there for, you know, months at best, really, but more than likely for most of the trips I took, they were weeks, right? Uh, and because I had to move around so much, I had only limited time in a, any given archive per trip. And so really I'm going through, I'm scanning through keywords. I'm taking photos of the documents that I believe I, I can use and I'm taking quick notes. So if I'm in the archive and I come across something and either I didn't take a note of it or I didn't take a good enough note of it or I was kind of like just offhand made a reference to something, it's entirely possible I could have missed something important. So I did my best to take quick notes that were give me just enough, you know, it, they were, it involved a lot of uh, exclamation points. If something had an exclamation point, or my gosh, if the exclamation point was highlighted, I better go back to that to that um, to that document. And so, in a large to a large degree, really, that's what kind of got me through uh, some of the most important collections that I used in actually writing the book. Um, and so, going back to the notes. Uh, and keeping everything organized in in folders. So if you were to sit at my desktop and go through all of my research materials for the book, which were, I couldn't even guess at a number. I don't know. I couldn't even guess at a number. Um, you would be. I mean, it's all. It, it's it would look like chaos, but there was a, there was a, uh, there was an organization to it. There was a what's the expression? Uh, an order to the disorder. <laughs> And I just well, learned to you, work with it. <laughs> if you ever want to learn about how to use Zotero and yeah, Adobe yeah. to your benefit, um, now I, I do. literally now run I training do. for it. Oh, great. So Terrific. That, thank you. We can, we can talk about that. Awesome. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Allison has a, a follow up talk about balancing different size tasks simultaneously. And then after that, Jen has a, a, a comment about the Montreal Fire. But I'm going to pass over to Allison now. Thank you. Yes, Allison, shall I read your question or would you like to chime in or should I just answer it? I can read it if you like. It's, um, sure, sure, either way. Thanks. Um, I just was interested in how you found the process of writing um, to the scale of the element, either after or alongside a more standard monograph. And I could hear the slippage between um, section and chapter and having just recently done an element and having oh, had terrific. chapters as sections and having a bit of a tussle with the production team about conceptual scale within a short piece of writing I was just curious as to yeah I was just really interested because it covered clearly covers so much it does thank you thank you um excellent question as well so it was really a, a kind of a really nice break or a relief even to start working on the element once I had submitted the full manuscript for the uh full-length monograph because you know the monograph this is um my first monograph once dissertation um, one could call it my tenure book, right? And so it was uh, heavily, heavily, heavily researched um, over many, many years and written very much, you know, for fellow scholars in in a number of discipline uh, of fields um, and disciplines, really. Um, and it's just, just kept meticulously to a certain voice, to a certain style. Um, whereas I was able to jump over to the element and do, uh, as Bethany, in fact, mentioned, you know, write in some ways the book, a very, very much shorter version of it uh, that I initially thought I was going to write, which is a sort of case studies on disasters. Um, even though in the element I look at, like I said, 300 years and in that initial conceptualization of what my dissertation was going to be, it was just 18th century, but nevertheless, um, it's a case studies, right? And so I was able to use a more, um, you know, more accessible 
prose and approach based largely on the, with the exception of my sections on my own research projects. So the New Orleans fire and the plague of Provence, it was otherwise based mostly on secondary research. Um, and so it was kind of a nice break. Um, and, it, and I think that worked to my benefit being able to, to get it out as relative to the first project for as relatively quickly as I did, which is why they both came out in the same year, which is crazy, you know, but um, if you look at the work behind it, it happened over a long period of time. Yeah. Fabulous, thank you. Hey, thank you. Jen, did you want to ask about the uh, Montreal Fire of 1734? Just share share the book that you mentioned. Yeah, I'll write it down. Okay. Oh, no, Jen's just sharing. Uh, oh, okay, great. Yeah, no worries. It it where is the title of the book? I'm sorry. So, so it's in the read. chat. Uh, it looks like it's called The Hanging of Angelique. Ah, okay. I am not familiar with it hanging on. I will share thank the you. chat with you afterwards thank you thank you and thank you for that recommendation and if there aren't any more questions I've been holding on to mine and actually the description of, of the the academic in the archives making notes and having to make decisions at speed um, kind of is a really nice analog to the public health you know, decision makers and the problems of the state. And I, I just, I was really interested in the tension between borders and porosity mm. in, um, in managing both managing disaster, but also in managing responses to disaster, because you need that porosity to get information, to get solutions, to move people around, to be in the right place, but you also need borders. And I was just wondering, mm -hmm. as you're thinking about the kind of nation state and the port city and and all that if you could reflect a bit on borders and porosity absolutely so one of the things that we see at this well we see on the one hand in what we can call continental europe during the plague of provence um the borders become more temporarily solidified right there's a lot less movement not just outside of provence but around france and as i said a lot of embargoes tit for tat embargoes uh, being uh, imposed, uh, as I said, I, I mentioned Great Britain, also Spain uh, and Portugal, just in response to one another, because they're, you know, they're like, oh, you're going to put an embargo against me because you think I'm not doing enough to protect against the plague, or I'm going to put an embargo against you as well. And so we see that uh, in mainland, uh, in, in the continental Europe. But interestingly, although there are attempts in the colonies, for example, to um, place uh, plague time measures and that kind of thing and limit movement uh, and prevent the entry of ships from suspicious areas and regions and things like that. They, it is, uh, and this, I'm just using the colonies kind of an example to give you kind of a contrast, right? In the colonies, it's much harder to impose. The colonies, uh, the European colonies and the Atlantic world in particular, but I also touch on very briefly on the uh, uh, in Manila in the Philippines, which was Spanish at the time. Um, it was much harder to impose plague time measures because it meant that any ship that wasn't allowed in was potentially a ship carrying very necessary goods that people absolutely needed. And that in some cases had been without for months and months. So I get a lot of letters, particularly in the Spanish documents, uh, colonial documents saying, you know, we've been told not to let in ships from France, but literally Spain hasn't, you know, we don't have, we haven't had any clothes here for a year, you know, and we need clothes, <laughs> literally talking about ropas and, and things like that. Excuse me. And, um, and so what we see is that the measures that are supposed to be put in place, especially in Spanish colonies are really just on paper and on the ground when it comes down to it, despite paying lip service to the authorities back in the, at home, they did what they needed to do to survive. You know, and so, so there are borders and there are porosity, so to speak. If that answers your question, in that, in that, in that sense, right? In that uh, example, um, and there are other ways of looking at it as well. Back in continental Europe, in terms of uh, migration at this time or lack thereof, um, 
and uh, resistance against some plague time measures that we see in some places and not others. We see a lot of resistance to plague time measures and attempts to limit movement in Great Britain and less so in Spain. Why, right? Why is there so much talk in Great Britain about, um, tr you know, the king is trying to act like despotic France or, you know, you're, this is a violation of, the li of our liberties. Why do we see that kind of rhetoric there? And I didn't personally come across anything like that in the Spanish uh, documents, right? So anyway, that's kind of a roundabout way of answering your question, but I hope that it starts to answer it. No, I think it's wonderful. It's the, the tensions between the, the need to be open for practical reasons and for, you know, logistical reasons and the need to be closed and, and how, right. you know, you can never actually do either. So that was really helpful. Right. I'm going to uh, read out Rebecca's question because she has a cold, um, which is about about teaching this material and have you um, brought disaster topics into your teaching? And, and if you have, how has it gone? I absolutely have. In fact, I teach a seminar. Um, I've taught it both as an undergraduate seminar and a graduate seminar on crisis and catastrophe in history. And this semester, in fact, so much more recently here, because the last time I taught the seminar was uh, the previous year, because I was on uh, research leave for a year, so it would have been before that. But um, this semester, I just taught my history of epidemics course. And I incorporated a full day on just the plague of Provence and, you know, the last outbreaks of plague in Europe. And I got to talk to students a little bit about my research process, my work in the archives to teach them, you know, a little bit about what the, his the historian's craft and, and all of that kind of thing. And I loved it. And I, I feel like they were really, really receptive to it. Not only did I get to talk about my own work, which I always enjoy of course, doing, right? We all do. But also um, just seeing, just hearing from them, like, oh, how cool it was to learn about what a historian actually does. It's not what I thought it was. Like, what did you think? Do you think we open history stores? <laughs> you know? And so, uh, so yeah, I absolutely bring it into the classroom. And I found, uh, I have found so far, at least, thankfully, that students are very, very receptive to it, to learning about what we do in our professions. You know, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any final questions for Cindy? I see one here from Robert. From yeah, so Robert uh, was going to, do you want more on why uh, the measures were more difficult to impose in the colonies, or did Cindy's answer to my question oh, right. anticipate that? <laughs> the needs of the colonies kind of outweighed yeah. the uh, the desires of the metropole, basically, in a nutshell. Excellent, yes. The needs, I, I think that, that, that sentence sums up Perfect. so much. <laughs> there you go. Uh, fantastic. Thank it you. is just about on the hour. So if there are no further questions, I give a chance for anyone to have a last minute brainstorm or. Um, OK, please. Thank you. Thank you join all me, so much. Join me in thanking Cindy for a wonderful way to um, round out what I'm sure has been a long and, and an exciting term for all of us. It's been a wonderful uh, lecture. And um, thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a real honor. And please... have a very happy, uh, happy break. Yes. Let everyone have a happy and restful break and then join us all in 2024, where we have three more exciting speakers for you. Thank you. Thank you. And good night. Good night. Thank you so much, Elaine.